like to welcome i would also like to welcome divetia sir dr divetia hello sir so dr divetia is a well known figure we all know that uh, he is uh, head of the department of intensive care at tata memorial hospital and now he is also a director of uh, tata memorial hospital uh, which is uh, located in punjab and this is his additional responsibility and i thank you very much sir for your uh, presence here and uh, we have uh, dr raymond savio also from apollo chennai critical care consultant at apollo chennai i welcome dr raymond uh, for this uh, uh, today's session and uh, with this uh, without taking much time i invite uh, dr gunadhar to start his presentation and we will have a strong discussion ahead thank you very much yeah thank you akhilesh uh, and thank you all the panelists here actually that is a uh, really uh, uh, big apology because i think uh, dr ansario also told me that to beg apology from his side because he is not feeling well and it's a last moment delay so he is just i think uh, sick uh, fallen sick at home so because of our uh, uh, fellows and uh, all our students so without any further delay i think there is two three interesting cases just this pre presentation was with me so we'll have a very short and sweet uh, presentation followed by the discussion from the intensive care perspective and i request all <clears throat> to uh, participate and make this session interesting and in interactive and uh, again uh, uh, big apology from our side so uh, this is basically a 30, 38 year old male uh, the he is who is a resident of alibag he came to our hospital he is a very young male without any comorbidity and uh, he has one day history of fever with chills and rigor he is complaining of breathlessness and cough the past history of multiple time went into paddy fields for fishing before and it was a rainy season so now with the arrival of this monsoon this uh, tropical infections are very very common so he got admitted with uh, alibag hospital and from there he came to our hospital with uh, fever breathlessness and decreased saturation so when he came here the patient is quite tachypneic he is febrile <clears throat> the temperature was on the very uh, higher range like uh, around almost uh, 100 more than 100 degree fahrenheit and uh, the blood pressure he is hypotensive <clears throat> he is tachycardic the saturation were quite low with uh, periphery is warm typically looks like a septic shock the ebg is suggestive of uh, severe hypoxia with low pf ratio with increased alveolar arterial oxygen gradient and it is a metabolic severe metabolic acidosis i can say the lactates are pretty high the capillary refill time which is a marker of the tissue perfusion and now regarded as one of the most important indicator of tissue perfusion is really poor it's more than 5 second so the one of the differential diagnosis for this patient in our uh, er is the septic shock with multi organ involvement so uh, uh, as a as a standard of care for all the dnb resident uh, we uh, this is basically the learning point like we followed the typical sepsis bundle uh, the one hour goal in our hospital the sepsis pathway the first thing is any critically ill patient who comes to the er the first thing is assessing the airway breathing and circulation so uh, we assess his airway breathing and circulation the patient is uh, becoming drowsy and uh, the the breathing is not good and his peripheries are warm and he is in he is in hypotension and shock so the first thing is the initial assessment we applied the niv and followed by the fluid resuscitation almost in the range of 30 ml per kg this patient was fluid responsive uh it's uh, it's uh, we uh, monitor the target like the output the tachycardia and uh, the heart rate the blood pressure all the cultures uh, has been sent the possible cultures like the blood culture the urine the cultures and the procalcitonin levels and he was started on with broad spectrum antibiotics the since this patient was in septic shock the first line of uh, any uh, uh, patient who comes from the peripheries with a previous hospitalization our policy is to start with the first generation or the uh, the carbapenems like meropenem and ticoplanin so the meropenem will a broad spectrum and will cover mostly the gram negative organisms and ticoplanin will cover the mostly the gram positive organism so we start the norad by the peripheral line is guided by the different trials that suggested that early starting of the noradrenaline really helps the patient in such kind of scenarios before we put a central line and sometimes the central lines are absolutely not necessary also if you try to resuscitate the uh, resuscitate the patient with the fluids every hourly we recheck the every two hourly we recheck the lactates and uh, the labs the initial labs is showing the creatinine levels of 2.4 the bilirubins are quite high with elevated sgot and sgpt the platelets are in the range of lower limit like it is thrombocytopenia with the hemoglobin level of 12.1 
So the possible cause of the septic shock in this patient is first my differential diagnosis is a tropical infection. The most likely source is either pulmonary or second is like uh, urosepsis and third is the abdominal sepsis because he has an elevated creatinine and he's having breathing difficulties. So these are my possible uh, differential diagnosis. So this is the initial uh, x-ray presentation. So if we look at the x-rays, typically the x-ray looks like bilateral fluffy opacities in the, both the bases. This is acute on onset within seven days of onset. This patient has this kind of x-ray at presentation. And this is the most likely differential diagnosis in this case is ARDS and possible ARDS, the cause is tropical infection, either the leptospirosis, malaria or dengue or any kind of uh, viral infection uh, leads to this kind of presentation. So whenever I see a patient with severe ARDS with such kind of uh, x-rays and the onset is very, very acute, actually it raises my red flag sign because young patient, we should be absolutely careful and this patient can deteriorate very rapidly. So with only 30 minutes of NIV trial in the emergency, so this patient was desaturating, the saturation went down to 65% and without any delay, we intubated this patient and there is a, obviously the pink for the sputum suggestive of uh, pulmonary edema or some kind of pulmonary hemorrhage. So during the intubation is the guidelines suggest we followed the rapid sequence induction intubation bundle and the, we put the patient in the long protective ventilation strategy with low tidal volume ventilation of 6 ml per kg of peep of almost 10 centimeter of water and the FiO2 in the range of 100%. So this is all more or less is quite similar to the condition where the patient has severe ARDS with a high PEEP requirement. And this, this is as per the ARDS net protocol trials, which says that, <clears throat> that initially you have to ventilate the patient with lung protective ventilation strategy. So the starting point of the volume ventilation of 6 ml per kg. The EBG repeated suggestive of severe respiratory acidosis with metabolic acidosis with hypoxia and the PF ratio was less than 100. So if we classify this patient, he is definitely belong, uh, means uh, categorized into severe ARDS. So this is one of the, uh, one of the, you can say the, one of the very difficult cases uh, to manage. And mostly in the COVID, we can, uh, we get such kind of cases where the PF ratio usually goes down less than 100. And we measure the lung compliance. The lung compliance are less than 20, 20 ml of per centimeter of water. And initial presentation, we calculated the Murray score. The Murray score is more than three. So there are three different areas of lung which is involved. And this patient has severe ET bleed that is more or less suggestive of severe pulmonary hemorrhage. So this patient is basically a patient of pulmonary hemorrhage with uh, your uh, increased creatinine. So you can say I, this is a syndromic approach, which is called as the hepatopulmonary syndrome. So all the differential diagnosis of fever with uh, high creatinine with ET bleed. So that is more or with thrombocytopenia that goes in the favor of tropical infections. So in the ICU, uh, this patient has severe bleed for the ET. When this patient was shifted, the patient was desaturated to the level of 40%. Uh, uh, the, the saturation went down to 40% and immediately he was decided to do a proning. Sometimes severe ET bleed may be a contraindication for the proning, but it's a relative contraindication. You do the proning for this patient, but in the prone position, the saturation go, goes down further less. That is almost the saturation reached the level of 20% with massive pulmonary hemorrhage, and he has a severe bleeding through the endotracheal tube. Immediately, we supine the patient and family counseled about the grave prognosis. So this is uh, one scenario we thought that uh, we might lose this patient, and it is a lost battle for everybody. So any probable options, if we th th think in the literature, probably the last resource is the Vino Vino ECMO, which is the last possible rescue measures. And we know that this carries a very, very high mortality in coagulopathic patient. So without further delay, we started the ECMO. And uh, this is just after the patient being, the ECMO being initiated, we can see uh, that this patient, the lungs are totally white out lungs. And we cannot find out any lung markings, basically in this patient. So if we see there are two uh, important uh, aspect in this X-ray chest. One is the, this cannula, which is called the superior vena cava cannula, and this is called the inferior vena cava cannula. And these are basically the two ECMO cannulas. So we put uh, around uh, uh, 25 gauge cannula in the femoral vein, which act as a drainage cannula in such patients. And we put uh, uh, 19 gauge uh, your uh, cannula in the right internal jugular vein. And we can very well notice, this is one of the important X-ray, which suggests that both the cannulas are very close to each other. If you see, there is actually, there is no gap. Ideally, whenever we initiate the ECMO, uh, there should be at least five to 10 centimeter of gap in any patient. 
to prevent the recirculation. So recirculation is basically one of the important drawbacks of ECMO patients. So, but this patient was not desaturating. So that is why we decided not to change the cannula position and not to disturb the patient, uh, your, uh, the, the flow and other parameters of the ECMO. So this is the uh, whole uh, scenario of the patient. The patient is on ECMO. This is the ECMO machine, the recent generation ECMO machine that is called the cardio help, which is being initiated in the ICU. And these are the, this is the superior venacaval cannula, which act as a, something called as the return cannula. And this is the drainage cannula. So the drainage cannula is put on the femoral uh, vein in case of veno venous ECMO, as the name suggests, and it drains the blood from the vein, that is the femoral vein. The blood goes to the oxygenator, and this is the membrane oxygenator, and this is attached with a pump, which is called the centrifugal pump. This is the basically the module, and this is the pump. This is the centrifugal pump, and which rotates, and there is an oxygenator which is attached to this machine. So this is the second generation ECMO machine, basically. And that is where the oxygenator and the pump are very, very close to each other. And the, after being oxygenated, this blood is being returned to the return cannula. So the most important point here is when we can see here that the color difference. So basically, whenever you, we put the patient on the ECMO, there is immediately there is a color difference of the blood which returns to the patient lung and the blood which is drained from the patient, uh, uh, the femoral vein. And we can clearly see that there is a color difference as well as the patient saturation improved drastically immediately and uh, the, the saturation became around in the range of 98 to 100%. This is basically something called as this sweep gas flow. The sweep gas flow is nothing, but it is the gas flow which is used to control the CO2. So the ECMO machine basically does two jobs. One is to correct the hypoxia and second is to correct the hypercapnia. So hypoxia is being corrected by two mechanisms. One is by the ECMO machine, there is a possible mechanism. This is the FiO2 adjustment. So once you go for the FiO2 from 60% to 100%, the oxygenator, the oxygenation improved. And second thing is to control the carbon dioxide. In the in case of type 2 respiratory failure or hypercapnic respiratory failure, along with hypoxia, where if we adjust the sweep gas flow, it, it basically causes more and more diffusion of carbon dioxide from the patient lung to the ECMO machine. So the we know the diffusion capacity of carbon dioxide is very, very high. That is the reason that we have to maintain the gradient for the lowering of the carbon dioxide. Whereas the hypoxia mechanism basically depends on the more and more oxygen availability. So we can adjust the hypoxia by correcting the FiO2 on the ventilator and correcting the FiO2 on the ECMOs. So the first goal is to keep the patient on 100% FiO2 so that initially all the organs which suffer from hypoxia, basically they are being prevented. And then slowly, slowly we go down on the something called as the ventilatory settings or goes down on the FiO2 requirement on the ventilator. So this patient is on multiple ionotropic support. He's on basically on dialysis because this is a slate machine. And sometimes most of the cases when these patients are being put on ECMO, they are basically already gone into multi-organ failure. So dialysis will be very much required. Sometimes we do a continuous renal replacement therapy that is called the CRRT. So CRRT, ECMOs, and ventilation, and multiple ionotropic supports. So these are the different cannulas I have shown. So this is a centrifugal pump, the second generation ECMO pump, which is called the CardioHelp machine, and this is the something called as the return cannula. So the ICU course is complicated by multiple times of bronchoscopy done in view of ET bleeds and the clots. This patient developed ultimately after seven days of stay in the ECMO pancreatitis, which is a very, very common complication is probably abdominal infections. Infections are very, very common in a patient with ECMO, probably in a good setup, you can prevent them, but uh, you cannot 100% prevent them like fungal sepsis, the MDR sepsis, like with carbapenem resistant bacteria are very, very common in such setup. So this is basically the X-ray after the sixth post, uh, you can say the sixth uh, day of stay in the ICU. We can clearly see that there is some improvement in the X-ray picture and we can at least see the lung marking and we can have Absolutely see this is the superior venacaval cannula or this is the return cannula, this is the endotracheal tube and this is the central line and we can see at least the lung has improved to some extent. So this is only the sixth day. So if any patient who recover very fast on the ECMO, so probably we can see that it's the lungs are not that stiff and this patient has recovered very fast. Sixth day I can say is a very fast because usually the ARDS patient they take almost two to three weeks, three weeks you can say to recover. And sometimes the recovery in a COVID, particularly in COVID ARDS can delay up to six weeks. And since this patient recovered very fast, probably the bleeding was uh, one of the important cause because uh, once you put the patient on ECMO and there is no bleeding and this patient usually they get uh, immediately uh, recovered with the ECMO. So, so this is basically the uh, patients on ECMO machine on the sixth post-operative day. 
so we stop the sedation usually we don't do not keep any sedative agents for a long longer time for first 24 to 48 hours we keep atricurium in a continuous infusion form till the patient do not fight with the ecmo machine in the ventilator once the patient effort requirement comes down on the ventilator and the patient is uh, the ecmo flow also is sufficient to maintain the oxygenation then in those cases usually we stop the sedative agent or the muscle relaxant first followed by the intermittent sedation and we always assess the gcs this is most important point because the patient may develop ic bleed ic bleed is one of the important complications of such kind of ecmo therapy so uh, the diagnosis which we get we got basically in this patient is severe leptospirosis the leptospira igm or pcr came positive and this is almost after the 10th icu day where the ecmo is being wind off and the patient is maintaining on the tps and this patient is on only tps without any ventilator and this is almost the 11th post uh, post icu day where the patient got extubated so this patient got extubated very very fast and this patient in being wind off from the ecmo very fast so if we see the the total ecmo days for this patient is 10 days average 10 days total icu stay is more than 20 days this patient stayed with us for almost for a period of one month the total hospital day is 32 days there is no residual sequelae some of the patients they have residual lung fibrosis neuromuscular weakness critical illness neuropathy myopathy infections and sometimes most of the patient they land up in tracheostomy sometimes ecmo related complications are very very high like ic bleed like multi organ dysfunctions like coagulopathy bleeding in the skin bleeding in the abdomen bleeding in the uh, gi tract those are very very common so this is one of the eye opener case for us and basically this is the non covid ecmo cases and going ahead further i'll just describe another three cases uh, which we did uh, and we successfully recovered this patient from ecmo so this is one of the case 32 year old female who came with severe breathlessness fever up to 2 to 3 days uh, the patient came to er with in a state of tachypnea he is tachycardic on niv almost 100% if i have to this patient maintained a saturation of uh, 80% immediately intubated the patient ventilated with lung protective ventilation strategy as per the irds net protocol almost on ventilation on prone position this patient require fio2 100% with peep of 10 the abg suggestive of severe respiratory acidosis with hypoxia the pf ratio as described is less than 100 the mori score is one of the important score which we calculate before putting the patient on ecmo is more than 3 this patient is being done prone ventilation and supine ventilation almost the prone ventilation has been carried out for 16 hours so we do practice prolonged prone ventilation and this is the initial vitals when the patient post intubation 100% fio2 on ventilator after 16 hours of proning we can see that the patient saturation is still 82% and uh, he is hemodynamically stable on the slightly tachycardic so again the ecmo was being initiated instituted in this patient and we see clear cut the same patient on ecmo here at least you can see slight lung marking as compared to the previous patient also i can see there is a the cannula position is very very i can say it very they are very close to each other in the x ray which is actually not desirable in the ecmo patient but since his saturation was in the range of 96% we did not disturb the cannula otherwise sometimes we may pull out the cannulas and we keep a distance of 5 to 10 cm between them to prevent the resurf- prevent the recirculation so uh, ultimately uh, the tracheostomy has been done for this patient his icu icu course is complicated by mdr sepsis neuromuscular weakness ecmo but ecmo we are able to win up the ecmo and the ecmo is being removed also multiple times bronchoscopy has been done and uh, the bronchoalveolar lavage has been sent and this patient has thrombocyte persistent of thrombocytopenia coagulopathy increasing uh, creatinine or some form of aki but he didn't require any dialysis support the probably the output was good every day we check for the 2d echo of the cardiac conditions and we see for the vti to give the fluid or not to give the fluid and the ecmo monitoring is done as per the charts so ecmo flows ecmo your something called as there are four or five things we use need to monitor on the ecmo machine so the most important is flow so when you compare the vv ecmo or veno venous ecmo the flow is very important normally we keep a flow of 5 to 6 liter if the patient goes into veno venous ecmo and uh, we also adjust the frequency the frequency or the revolution so revolution per minute is a ma- machine setting usually we keep the revolution in the range of 3 3000 to 4000 the more high the revolution or frequency we keep there is a high chances of hemolysis that is why we do not usually go beyond 4000 
but the flow depends on the revolution per minute that is why if you change want to alter the flow either you have to come down on the revolution per minute or you have to increase the revolution per minute the second thing is ecmo fy2 third thing is sweep gas flow on the ecmo and the fourth thing is measuring the continuous hemoglobin saturation on the ecmo machine so there are specialized probes which is fit into the cannula which can detect your continuous mixed venous oxygen saturation so the most important part in the ecmo is the monitoring the mixed venous oxygen saturation so we keep it in the range of 65 to 70 percent so if you see this patient is a case of influenza a positive and he is being landed up because of the influenza a virus uh, ards so nowadays you are getting a lot of cases of influenza a epidemic particularly after this covid wave has subsided Basically, a lot of patients with influenza and uh, H1N1, they are landed up in our ICUs with uh, severe ARDS. Almost, we have right now four to five patients whom we are doing awake proning. And most of the patients, they are getting settled with this awake proning maneuvers with BiPAP or something called as high flow nasal cannula. So in this patient, we see these are the sequential images. So these are the first, for the first uh, day, this is almost in the third to fifth day. This is the 7 to 10 day and ultimately the patient is tachostomized and the ECMO cannulation has been removed and there is still a, some kind of residual fibrosis in this patient. So the total ECMO days, definitely it fits with the ARDS uh, age expected 21 days, almost 3 to 4 weeks is the healing time which is required by the ARDS patient. The total ICU days, almost this patient stayed with us for more than 30 days. The hospital stay is around 45 days. And this patient is also discharged without any sequelae. So this is one of the patient who required the longest ECMO stay in our hospital. That is why I have taken this case and he has been successfully discharged. So the third case, going to the third case, he's an elderly female. So basically he presented with severe breathlessness, intubated, ventilated, requiring almost 100% oxygen, saturations in the range of 87%, immediately prone, lung compliance is very poor, less than 25 ml per centimeter of water. ABG is suggestive of severe respiratory acidosis with severe hypoxia with low PAO to FI2 ratio. The Murray score is more than three. And you can see this is the lung picture. So classical ARDS, classical ARDS with bilateral opacities, which is non-cardiogenic in onset, acute in onset, and which is not explained by fluid overload. And there are also, if you see, uh, bilateral symmetrical involvement of both the lungs. So in such type of X-ray picture is really scary. So this patient after intubation, after central line. So VV ECMO was initiated and this patient was almost for a, more than three weeks on the ECMO support. The tracheostomy was done. He is successfully wind off and decannulated and this patient got discharged. So this is basically the X-ray picture. So this is the first X-ray where the ECMO being initiated. You cannot see the lower cannulas or the femoral cannulas here. Uh, probably the x-ray was not, the exposure is not proper. And this is the tracheostomy and tube. And this patient was, this is a rotated film. This patient got, uh, means wind up and shifted to the ward with tracheostomy. And we can see there is an improvement in the lungs after uh, three to four weeks of uh, this lung re rehabilitation program and post ECMO recovery. So this is the post ECMO survivor. So basically this is the patient who stayed with us for more than 45 days with us. And this is our chest physicians. And this is the post ECMO survivor. The case number three, so I think the case number four, so by mistake, this is the, probably the last case I have with me. And he's a 46, 46 year old male resident of Parsi Hill. This is a very interesting case because uh, this is an elderly gentleman where actually we failed to establish any diagnosis in the initial days. And he has a, he came to us with only two days history of diarrhea, no other comorbidity and sorry, four days history of loose motion and only fever episode for three days. And he has history of COVID infection in four to five months back. He presented to us with progressive breathlessness. He has completed his vaccination status. He's hemodynamically stable. And initially, 2 d done. that is that not suggestive of any RIRV dilatation that ruled out the pulmonary embolism. So this is the initial X-ray presentation. So this is the second day of X-ray the patient came to us. And this patient is almost landed up in 100% FiO2. Actually, we are planning for a CTPA, but since this patient progressively deteriorated in, within a period of 12 hours, we are we could not able to do a CTPA. And this is the initial X-ray presentation. So any young male with this kind of X-ray with high oxygen requirement, actually, uh, this is a very, uh, you can say the uh, uh, difficult uh, things that, and this is a very um, difficult situation to handle because the family always expect when the patient comes to you in the working, talking state, and the patient suddenly landed up in ventilator after two to three days of uh, the initial presentation. This is something very difficult to explain to the family also. 
so initial methods of treatment abc assessment of the abc the niv applied but this patient worsened very fast almost within 6 hours this patient worsened almost he landed up in 100% niv intubated ventilated with lung protective ventilation strategy lung compliance this patient is surprisingly quite good so this is one of the cases where we find the lung compliance to be in the higher range so these are the few cases where we find that the in spite of the patient got ventilated the lungs are not stiff so these are the something typical of uh, particularly the covid lungs but surprisingly all his covid test came negative so we repeated covid multiple times but this covid became negative for all uh, multiple times but his lung compliance is very very good still he requiring a very high oxygen support so these patients usually we don't prefer to give a very high peep when their lung compliance are good actually so this patient requiring a fio2 100% with peep of 10 cm of water the saturation in the range of 86% and the pf ratio is less than 100 abg suggestive of again hypoxia severe hypoxia the mori score is more than 3 the ventilation index is more than 90 so if you go to the actually uh, the uh, something called as the uh, app android app station you can find there are two or three good apps we can which actually the one is called the ecmo calculator so there you, we can find a very good uh, uh, calculation of different scoring system for ecmo patients so that make our job very very easy so this is called ecmo calculator so ventilation index is one of them and this is the initial x-ray presentation we can clear cut see that there is bilateral floppy opacities and this is a case of severe ards post intubation proning has been done only one session of proning we gave to this patient because we know that this patient will deteriorate very fast because he's not going to benefit from the prone when the lung compliance is something is very good and there is absolutely no change in the peep and fi requirement without any delay the vv ecmo was initiated we can see the subsequent x-rays of this patient so uh, this is the first x-ray this is after three to five days with the ecmo cannula with the ventilation with the tube endotracheal tube and this is we get after something seven to ten days you can see still on the ecmo the left side of the chest is having effusion with developing a patch and uh, this patient is still hypoxic and he is requiring a very high flow almost the flow in the range of six liter to support the oxygenation so uh, this patient is basically on ECMO and tracheostomy we did early because you know he is a patient who is going to not recover very fast. A multiple times bronchoscopy at regular interval has been done. He has uh, suffered from DIC and uh, he has also suffered from hemolysis because of the ECMO pump and he's required multiple transfusions. The work for the lung transplantation is undergoing currently because this patient is almost for with us for more than 42 days and the family being counseled for the multidisciplinary team by the ICU and the transplant team. So these are the patients where you find that basically where the outcome is not very good. And in spite of the ECMO, the moment we decrease the ECMO flow in this patient to four liter or three liter, this patient is desaturated up to the level of 85%. So that's, this is the area where almost this is this happening after a period of four to six weeks. And when we do, when you did the bronchoscopy, basically the bronchoscopy, we can find the bronchus, all the peripheral branches are absolutely clear. So I have discussed this case with many of the ECMO centers and they are in the favor that this such kind of lung where you can find the bronchoscopy is absolutely clear. The patient were not able to win from the ECMO and the almost, already the four to six weeks has been passed. Pro. So most of the COVID patient, they uh, behave in this way. So anyway, so the COVID for this patient came negative, but uh, we treat him like a COVID patient. Still, ECMO is running more than four weeks, and this case, ECMO is an eye opener, and this serves as a bridge to the transplant. So, not all the cases of ECMO patient get recovered and do well. Sometimes we have to see to it the consequences also. So, we can see these are the different cannulas, and we can see after six weeks or four weeks of therapy, ECMO therapy, the lungs are still hazy, and the lungs are still, uh, you know, there is no uh, appreciable lung marking. And this is also the same uh, patient's X ray, he's on tracheostomy with ECMO cannula in situ. So uh, just uh, last few slides about the history of ECMO. So ECMO is used as an extended agent bridge to transplant. The first case of ECMO is being done in 1960. And the first reported use of ECMO for extracorporeal life support by Donald Hill in the year 1972. And in 1975, the ECMO is used extended as a bridge to transplant and the lung transplant. In 1980 uh, to 2000, basically there is there are very limited use of ECMO. And the people have used ECMO probably only to a bridge to transplant due to poor outcomes from various prospective studies. So if you see the literature, there are not much studies and which will tell you that, yes, if you put the patient, uh, patient on ECMO, the survival is 100%.
So that is the reason the, this is the era where you can call it as the era of silent, silent ECMO from 1980 to 2000. And after that, in the late of 2000, almost we developed the heparin coated circuits and centrifugal pumps, actually, which actually was proved to be a game changer in the ECMO over the traditional roller pump. And with the new innovations in the polymethyl pentane oxygenator after 2006, so the greatest landmark trial which came in ECMO is 2006 seizure trial, which actually basically an eye opener and it clear cut proven that the patient who refer to the ECMO center for the ECMO, obviously there is a mortality benefit. So it is one of the trial which proves the mortality benefit. That is why it is an eye opener. And after that, there are new innovations happened in the field of ECMO, the like in the form of polymethyl pentane oxygenator. In 2009, when H1N1 influenza strike the world, there is extensive use of ECMO with the extensive use of dual lumen avalon cannula. And there is increasing use of ECMO as a transplant to bridge due to the advancement in technology and institution experience. And we know the story, the present of uh, the uh, present uh, scenario in the ECMO. Now I think uh, the, now the every peop, every common man now knows what is an ECMO. So no need to dis discuss about this. So these are the few guidelines I would like to highlight. These are called the extracorporeal life support organization guidelines. So what are the guidelines we suggest in which patient the ECMO should be considered? So the first thing is common indications like for venovenous ECMO. So you know that ECMO are mainly two types. One is the venovenous ECMO and second is the veno arterial ECMO. So the venovenous ECMO is put for the acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. Whereas the veno arterial ECMO is best basically put for the acute cardiogenic uh, cause, mostly for the heart failure and for cardiac support. So the indication for the venovenous ECMO is hypoxemic respiratory failure with low PA to FI to ratio after optimal medical management. So they have stressed that uh, optimal medical management is very, very important, including any absence of contraindication. So what are the contraindications? The first thing is any coagulopathy. So a trial of prone positioning should be ideally given before we put the ECMO. And we know that if the patient did not improve with prone positioning, ECMO is the only option. So if there is a 50% mortality risk associated with PA to FR2 ratio of less than 150, and if the patient is requiring more than FR2 of 90%. Also, we know that there is 80% mortality risk associated with ECMO despite the optimal care and also the, despite the optimal therapy. Second indication of ECMO is hypercapnic respiratory failure. Though we have other uh, in, uh, important uh, machineries or development like something called as the ECOR, only for isolated hypercapnic respiratory failure, but still if the patient is on ECMO, it can also correct the carbon dioxide level and ECMO is a very good machine which can correct both oxygen and carbon dioxide. So despite the optimal conventional mechanical ventilation, if the patient is going into persistent hypercapnic respiratory failure, it is one of the uh, important therapy. Second thing is ventilatory support is a bridge to transplant. So if the patient is not improving and is a candidate for lung transplant, sometimes as a bridge to transplant, we put the patient on ECMO and follow up subsequently work up for the lung transplant. So there are certain special conditions like where ECMO is indicated, Relatively indicated, I can say, acute respiratory distress syndrome, viral pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia with severe IDS, acute eosinophilic pneumonia, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage or pulmonary hemorrhage, severe bronchial asthma, or you can say refractory status asthmaticus, primarily to correct the carbon dioxide, thoracic trauma, severe inhalational injuries, large bronchopulmonary fistulas, and sometimes it can be worked also as a perilung transplant, like primary lung graft dysfunction and bridge to transplant. There are relative contraindications for VV ECMO. So the first and foremost thing is CNS hemorrhage, significant central nervous system injury, irreversible and incapacitating central nervous system pathology, systemic bleeding, contraindication to anticoagulation, immunosuppression, older age, mechanical ventilation for more than seven days with P plateau pressure more than 30 centimeters. This is a last uh, relative contraindication I have kept because sometimes we also put the, we have also used ECMO in our centers when the patient is more than seven days on ventilator. But sometimes it's the more the patient on ventilator and he's not improving, obviously we can see the response to ECMO is also guarded. So these are the different trials. The first trial I can, uh, I have highlighted like the seizure trial in 2016, uh, sorry, 2006. So this is a randomized uh, uh, control trial of conventional ventilatory support versus extracorporeal membrane oxygenation for severe adult respiratory distress syndrome. So basically this is a positive trial. I can say this has shown that there is a mortality benefit if the patients are being referred to the ECMO center. 
the second most important trial which is a recent trial and uh, i am fortunate to meet the principal investigator uh, uh, dr alan kum here in the paris and i have gone to the institute for the training of the ecmo so basically the ecmo for severe ids this is something called as the aolia trial so the aolia trial is the recent trial actually this shows that there is no significant benefit of mortality at day 60 as compared with a strategy of conventional mechanical ventilation which include crossover to ecmo so if we put a patient on conventional ventilation and uh, like if you start uh, conventional ventilation with a protocolized approach and if you start ecmo there is absolutely they they have found out that there is no much benefit so this is a negative trial i can say so uh, this is our experience we can say the most of the cases of ecmo in our centers where we get success and is mostly the vv ecmos so the out of all the uh, 14 cases uh, almost uh, we can say the total number of ecmo cases we have performed till it is 18 and total number of covid ecmo is 10 total number of non covid ecmo is 5 and we can say this the death rate is pretty high and this is also a uh, i can say the basically uh, worldwide the data also suggests the same there is a 50% 50 to 60% mortality the cost is also very high and the most of the success stories with the vv ecmo so almost out of uh, 50% uh, our population has got survived because of the ecmo so we, so so these are the evolving outcomes of ecmo support in covid 19 the finding from the different international also registry so they have also quite suggest the same thing in the covid ards the reports are pretty bad whereas in case of influenza h1n1 ards i can say that the the, uh, the success story of ecmo is quite promising so to end of my talk uh, this is my last slide uh, probably i can say the ecmo is a teamwork excellence is a teamwork because this is something uh, the tensing when he try to uh, cover up the uh, try to ride basically the himalayas initially many of the time he failed but uh, when he met elari basically the the duo has uh, able to uh, conquer the uh, this uh, peak of the everest so that is why you have to start with the team the the good team is very very important so our ecmo team consists of intensivists cvts perfusionist physicians chest physicians the cardiologist the support system is very very important the labs the micro the id the staff nurses particularly the ecmo trained staff the administration support is very important and this is our ecmo team particularly in the time of covid so with this i would like to end my lecture and uh, i think we can take up the discussion so my take home message is live beyond ecmo live beyond ventilation either it is ecmo ecor elvad arvad or mars or finally the patient land up in organ transplant but the team work is very very important in all the all these aspects thank you wow a wonderful deliberation dr gunadhar i mean impressive uh, outcomes uh, and then these are the experiences that you have shared it is quite overwhelming and it's a teamwork uh, which is more important so uh, i have a few questions uh, to you and uh, the panelist as well so uh, there has been a persistence of uh, thinking uh, as far as uh, ecmo services are concerned like you know in ecmo how early the ecmo should be instituted and uh, the recent trial which has come up uh, evolia trial which is negative trial so on the basis of this what will be the best time to institute uh, ecmo because sometimes it happens that you know uh, the ecmos have been instituted early versus ecmos which have been instituted later the results have not shown some change as, as far as our outcomes are probably concerned but what will be the best time to select patient you know uh, and putting them on ecmo so over to you dr gunadhar and uh, we have dr raymond i mean dr raymond if you can also answer and uh, we have uh, the vtsr also uh, sir would you like to highlight few points about evolia trial also we would be happy to uh, know about the trial as well and what were the drawbacks of the trial uh, we would like to know about that as well So I would like Dr. to, yeah, yeah, Doctor Gunadhar, yeah. No, I would like sir to answer because this is very important for our DNBs and uh, to understand the different literature pertaining to the ECMO and. Uh... 
Dr. Raymond, if you're there, can you just highlight a few points? So, so, uh, so I understand basically the today's talk actually is, is a unscheduled talk because uh, Dr. Ansari was not well. So sometimes it is very difficult uh, uh, for everyone to, uh, you know, uh, to uh, come unprepared and uh, this thing to deliver the lecture, but it will be a, it will be a, some kind of knowledge if uh, anybody can share in the forum, which will help our uh, DNBs and our fellows to prepare themselves from the exam point of view. It will be definitely highly appreciated. So uh, I would just like to highlight one issue. So one question is like, how is ventilation index applied practically and what are the normal values? So, oh, I have uh, described like one is the ECMO calculator. So everybody can download it, the ECMO calculator from the net. So this ECMO calculator consists of a uh, different scoring system. So if you go to the ECMO calculator, it has something called as the safe score. Second is called the rest score, rape score and Piper score, the Morris score, the preset score, the PF ratio, the oxygenation index, the ventilation index, the static lung compliance, then something called as the recirculation factor, the PCO2 adjustment, the delta pressure. The delta pressure is nothing but it is the pressure difference across the oxygenator, the P1, P2, and P3, P4. So there are there are four pressures we usually uh, monitor in the ECMO. So something called as the pressure difference across the oxygenator. So if there is a high pressure gradient across the oxygenator, so something then we have to see that the oxygenator is functioning properly or not. So that is where the pre-oxygenator and the post-oxygenator AVG is very, very important sometimes. And if there is a there is something called as the, there should be a saturation gap, like the post-oxygenator ABG should be definitely a very good ABG compared to the pre-oxygenator ABG. Then we know that our oxygenator is uh, functioning optimally. And this is something called as the ventilation index. So ventilation index is basically calculated on the basis of respiratory rate. Second is called the peak inspiratory pressure. Third is called the peak and expiratory pressure and carbon dioxide content of the arterial blood. So there is a calculator, you have to just put the value. So once you put the value, then this is this will give you a, uh, something called as the ventilation index value. So normally in the adult, so if the ventilation index is more than 90 on this calculator for more than four to six hours, in adult patients I'm talking about. So these patients are probably a candidate for the ECMO if you have already given a prone ventilation. Similarly, if in case of children, if it's the ventilation index is more than 40 for four to six hours, and probably these children are the ideal, uh, you can say you can consider ECMO for them. So this is how the ventilation index is just a number actually. So it will just uh, guide you whether actually ECMO is going to benefit such patient or not. And this is called the ventilation index. Yeah, so I think uh, Dr. Dibetia has also uh, been found to be busy and uh, Dr. Raymond is also busy. So uh, it will be uh, uh, a question answer session which was planned, but I think we'll have to differ from that. But a few questions uh, which may be asked in the chat box will be definitely answered if we have some questions. So as far as the ventilation strategy is concerned, uh, I think early uh, ventilation and early proning and then early ECMO uh, is found to be very useful. Uh, what do you say, Dr. Vinader? I mean, uh, delaying, uh, you know, uh, uh, ECMO institution has resulted in significant injury to the lungs. And then um, the uh, recovery also gets delayed. So as far as possible, if initial uh, ventilation strategy has failed, if the plateau pressures are going very high and prone positioning is also not uh, uh, sig significantly improving the you know, oxygenation, probably that should be the point of time where we should uh, uh, start ECMO at the earliest. But prolonged uh, uh, proning also, you know, uh, 
should be monitored well. If the plateau pressures are staying uh, in the range of 20 to 30, probably uh, uh, the proning can also be, uh, uh, you know, continued for longer duration. But, uh, you know, uh, rather than just monitoring uh, plateau pressure, I think if we can monitor transpulmonary pressure, that also will give us a good idea because there are situations which we have found out that, you know, even if the patient has a higher plateau pressures, but if their transpulmonary pressures are lower, they can still withstand a little higher tidal volumes and probably we can continue. So, but monitoring of transpulmonary pressure is also a little difficult. You need to have um, esophageal catheter in place and continuous monitoring uh, is also required. But as long as uh, the oxygen requirement is coming down, and the plateau pressure is staying in the uh, acceptable range. I think proning can also be accepted for a longer duration. We have uh, we have avoided ECMOs in few patients. Uh, I think Dr. Gunadar, you would also accept. Few patients have come for us for definitive ECMO institution, but uh, we have tried ECMO, uh, prone positioning. We monitor plateau pressures judiciously. And some of these patients have got away without ECMO as well. So that's why it's a continuous monitoring and judicious uh, uh, tidal volume and lung protection is the key. And then basic nursing care is also very, very important. As we know, the teamwork is very, very important. So it's the basic housekeeping of the ICU. Uh, okay, your feeding, analgesia, physiotherapy, and uh, giving good sedation, analgesia. And prevention of complication is also one of the key uh, for uh, successful outcomes in any patients with the ARDS, even with the prone position or even if the patient has ECMO, I think uh, uh, housekeeping, good housekeeping is very, very important. So what is the one question is what is the maximum duration of cycle of proning? So we have tried as much proning as possible. And uh, in fact, um, two or three patients, actually they got better with proning. So till the patient is getting benefit with the proning and uh, you are able to manage the proning because it's require a lot of manpower, a lot of supports, the supporting staffs. So till that time, unless until the patient has some contraindication like either increased uh, raised ICP or like so some kind of intraabdominal bleed or something. So I think the proning should be definitely uh, given to the patient as maximum proning is uh, very helpful. And sometimes you can give the extended proning up to a period of 12 to 16 hours. And uh, sometimes uh, if the lung is sometimes so sign of recovery, sometimes in the proning phase, you also came to know that the daily measurement of the compliance, like the compliance will be always in the improving side. So such cases, ideally you can consider uh, giving the proning as, as far as possible. So, but there is no thumb rule as such as to how many uh, sessions of uh, proning should be uh, advocated. Uh, but as long as uh, the driving pressure and plateau pressures are improving, means uh, lung compliance is improving, oxygenation is improving, we can still continue doing prone positioning. But at times it has happened that there is some improvement in the oxygenation or the compliance is improving, we get carried away and uh, we stop uh, proning the patients. So uh, in this situation, what has happened, like we start proning and then again, these patients get de-recruited and then next time when you start proning, uh, it doesn't help much. So sustenance of the proning and the sustenance of the uh, ox improvement in the oxygenation is also a parameter which will guide us. So, but yes, a continuous monitoring is very, very important. And uh, there are centers which have extended prone positioning even for more than 18 hours. Uh, I have experienced uh, using prone positioning for even 36 hours and 48 hours also the proning has been continued. Uh, this is especially uh, possible in setups, I mean, uh, where you have good uh, support services. But uh, uh, but if the manpower is uh, deficient, okay, repeated proning is not possible or the patient is extremely unstable uh, uh, hemodynamics-wise or patient is on high vasopressors, probably in this uh, situation, uh, the decision will be dependent on uh, how the patient is behaving and the proning can be extended if the patient is hemodynamically stable and the oxygenation is improving, it can be extended up to 36 or 48 hours. Though there are no trials as such which have documented that the duration of uh, 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 proning can be extended up to 36 or 40, uh, 48 hours, but the 
the trials uh, have uh, you know the olia trial or the caesar trial have shown that the uh, proning can be continued for 16 to 18 hours as it is yeah absolutely so i think there is no more questions uh, in the chat box and uh, i really appreciate and thank to all my panelists my teachers and uh, other seniors who are there and also to all the our uh, dm students and all the delegates and the moderator dr akhilesh also and i think uh, today's session uh, due to some uh, this uh, was not being organized to organize properly because of the sickness issue of our speaker but definitely the next next session we have a very interesting topic on leadership in critical care so i would again request all of you to be there and uh, participate in the session thank you so thank you very much thank you thanks thanks thanks